Amen. If you think you've learned it all and know it all, you're sadly mistaken. You better believe it. I've learned some things in the last few days, learned them, experienced them, I'd never experienced before. Turn to Hebrews 11 with me now this morning. Hebrews chapter number 11. And verse number 6, Hebrews 11, 6. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 6. By, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Father, bless this holy word now, Lord. Give me unction to send it forth. Use me, Father. In thy holy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. I'd like to clarify something this morning as I get into the message and make it very simple. I'm not God's high sheriff, and I am not God's district attorney. I'm his messenger. Amen. That's my responsibility. That's as far as I go. And if you know anything about life, you understand the other two that I mentioned certainly have a needful place. No question about that. Honorable positions, no doubt it whatsoever. But that's not my calling. I'm called to be a messenger. And what I find in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, quite remarkable things, you study your Bible. Because you'll realize, as you know Scripture, that the people that are mentioned here are anything but uh, a lot of the, their life great champions of faith. Truth of the matter is, many of them had to be brought to that place. But what you'll find here in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, well, this, this is important, is that God does not point out their failures. What he does is point out the uh, accomplishments as the hand of God begins to move in their lives. And this is a great lesson we learn in life. If we really learn that lesson, let it right in our soul, we'll learn something about life and we'll learn something about each other. Uh, if you're a great champion of faith, you didn't do that for yourself. That was something that God worked in you. He that worketh in you to do and to will of his good pleasure is what the scripture says. If you have faith today, it's not something you found. It's not something that you produced. You certainly can't buy it. It is something that comes only from God. It's the gift of God. The Bible says, the entrance of thy word giveth light, giveth understanding to the simple. And these are the very basic foundations of what faith is all about. The greatest faith that anyone will ever have is what he said in Jeremiah chapter number 9. He said, let him that understandeth knoweth me. And that is the greatest thing that any of us will ever know. And that is to truly know the Lord. Do we really know him? Do we know who he is? Do we know something about his character? Do we understand how he really deals with men? For the Bible says the ways of the Lord are not our ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are his ways higher than our ways. And his thoughts are our thoughts. God Almighty has made you in his image, but you're not him. There's so much more that we'll ever know and learn about the Lord. If you notice, the Bible said Jacob was an heir of the promise. And my, this scripture, that's a great thing to say of Jacob. But if the Jacob that I know, he was also a usurper. He started taking, clawing, climbing, hammering, kicking people out of his way to get what he wanted. Now, maybe you've known Jacob or maybe you are Jacob and you haven't learned that lesson yet. But Jacob allowed God toward the end of his life to begin to see the hand of the Lord moving in places where he could have never done it. And so we find in Hebrews chapter number 11 that even though these are the great heroes of faith, and they are, this is not to denigrate them in any manner, it's to use them as objects of teaching and lessons that can be learned. It's not what Jacob was that God was so much interested in as it was as to what God was going to make him and what he was going to do with him. That was far more important. Take Sarah, for example. When she stood in the tent and heard the Lord speaking to her, her husband Abraham about the fact that she would have a child, the Bible said she laughed. That laughter was mockery. No way, in the, what are you talking about? Why, it's you're ridiculous. This is crazy. But you see, the Bible teaches us very clearly, not by power nor by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And uh, it takes us a while to learn this in our lives, but the spirit is everything. Not part of it, all of it. 
because the Spirit is the very life-giving essence to whatever you lay your hand to. You lay your hand to the work of God with the wrong spirit, my dear friend. What you may be doing may be altogether right, but it's still going to come to naught. It's going to die in your very hands. Sarah, the Bible said, received strength because she eventually trusted God and allowed him to do something in her life. Look at Moses. He chose the time to deliver his people. He thought the time was right. An Egyptian was smiting a Hebrew. So he smote the Egyptian. I'm sure that in his mind he had every right to do what he did. But then he was surprised to find out that they weren't ready to receive him. Not then. Because the timing of God is everything. Maybe you have smote an Egyptian. Maybe you have raised up your hand in the service of the Lord and found that you were rebuked and it didn't work. Well, my dear friend, don't quit. The timing is everything with God. It may be on down the road, the future, where God begins to move in your life and in your soul. He argued with the Lord there at the burning bush. Said, oh, you, Lord, now I know you're a good God, but you made a big mistake this time. I am not eloquent. And of course, uh, you know, his brother was eloquent, but his brother didn't have any spiritual discernment, did he? No, it's not how you can blabber. It's what goes on inside the soul. Lord said, I'm aging. I gave you a tongue. But you see what happened was Moses was a man with a temper. He had a temper. And I, I've got a little temper. How many of you got tempers in this house today? You got a temper? Well, I'm sure you, most people have somewhat of a temper. They can get mad. I mean, it, it's kind of good to see somebody sweat every once in a while. They're still alive. Amen. <laughs> yes, but you see, that temper got him into trouble. And God and Moses got into all kinds of problems. But you see, the Lord said to Moses one day, I'm going to write another book. I'm going to take their name out of this book. I'm going to blot them from this book. And here's what Moses said to the Lord. He said, all right, you take their name out. You take my name out. Oh, it made God mad. No, it didn't make him mad. Oh, no, 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 no. No, he that searcheth the hearts and the reins. Here's what God said in his soul. I got me a man that's willing to die for his people. Oh, yeah. Doesn't get any better than that. This is an intercessor. I got my man. That's what God said. You see, he tries you. He tries you to bring out from you what's hidden within you. And some of you have things hidden within you this morning that have never been touched. There are parts of your life that have never been touched by the hand of God. But when he touches it, dear friend, don't rebel against him. Don't kick against him. Don't run from him. Come to him. Call, call upon him, fall at his feet, ask him to help you and he will. Because you see, my dear friend, the truth of the matter is most of us are enthroned upon a throne in our lives. It's us that's enthroned. Oh, we give Christ lip service. We talk about him. We sing about him. We know how to worship. We've got it all organized. We've got the flashing lights and the loud music and the drums and all the rest of that. But the truth of the matter is until Christ is enthroned in your life, you're going to have a lot of struggle going on. And for the Apostle Paul said, for to me to live is Paul and to die is gain. Did I, did I mess up on that? For to me to live is what? Christ and to die is gain. So God's got to kick me off of my throne. Amen. Oh yeah, preachers get on thrones. You got some silvery tongued, holier than thou, uh, you know, with medals hanging around him to the floor, all the titles that men can hang up on somebody and all of this, and he struts his stuff before. Remember this, he puts his pants on the same way you do. Yes, he does. And he's the same inside his soul as you. And so am I. And there is no difference. There's only one that deserves our praise and our worship. And he is, sits upon the throne. God found his man, Saul of Tarsus. He persecuted the church. He did. He drug, drug them to Jerusalem, bound to be stoned to death. My, what a hard-hearted, cold individual. But you see, the apostle Paul was changed. He was changed because he came into contact with God. And here's the thing he said. He said, I'm willing to go to Jerusalem and die for this gospel that I preach. In plain words, Saul of Tarsus says, I'm willing to go to Jerusalem and die for the very God that at one time I persecuted. Amen. Can he change you? Oh, yes, he can change you. You say, well, I'm trying to change. Quit trying to change. 
All you'll do is create another devil just like the one you are. Did you hear me? Quit trying to make something of your life and create your own righteousness and fashion yourself after God and this and that and this and that. Humble yourself before the mighty hand of the Lord. Let him do a work of grace inside your soul that only the Holy Ghost can do. And you'll see a change take place in you that you could never do yourself. Amen. Did you hear what I said? It takes the grace of God working in us, the power of the Holy Spirit of God, and he'll change you from the inside out. And once he has changed you, the change will be permanent. You'll take no glory for it. David is listed here as a champion of faith, but who was David, king of Israel? David was a king, he was the, he was the, he was the shepherd king of Israel. David was an adulterer, we know all about that. He was a murderer, we know all about that. And, but you know something about David? One of the greatest passages in the Old Testament, truth of the matter is it lays it out more than any other place in the Bible as to how a sinner gets right with God. The 51st chapter of Isaiah, it's David. God used David, this man, to show you what it's like to get right with God. I mean, point after point after point. And I have seen many people go to where David got right with God. And that, my dear friends, is a mark of a hero. But the heroes that are mentioned in Hebrews 11 are all flawed human beings. Every one of them. And until you're willing to take your place with them, you'll never be worth a dime for God. Because you'll be full of yourself. You'll be walking around with self-righteousness. You'll be promoting your accomplishments. It'll be all about you. And that's all people will ever hear and see when they get around you. You will, boy, I was really impressed with him. He's a great man. We don't need great men. We need a great God. Amen. Great men are dying every day, folks. Amen. And, the, and, the, and their worshipers are, are certainly taken aback. I mean, when this greatest of all, the greatest preachers that built the greatest churches in the greatest work for God, how great they are. What are we going to do when they're gone? We're going to come back to the one who made it all work to begin with. That's what we'll do. Amen. Here's what it says in Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Behold, I have received commandment to bless, and he hath blessed, and I cannot reverse it. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord is God, is with, the Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. Who said that? Balaam said that, a prophet. Did you know that Balaam wound up be, uh, being killed in battle? But Balaam prophesied many truths, Truths, yes he did. And his truth here is this. When Balak tried to get Balaam to curse Israel, and Balak was an enemy king, and he tried to get it, this prophet to curse Israel, the prophet said, I can't curse what God has blessed. And, but here's the greatest thing about it. It is then when the Lord spoke through him, he said, I have not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. Now wait a minute, what's going on here? I mean, what's wrong here? What, what do you mean he hasn't seen uh, iniquity in Jacob or perverseness in Israel? This brings out a Bible principle that's one of the greatest truths that you can learn in Scripture, folks. If you can latch your hands on hold of what I'm about to say to you, it'll change your life. It really will. It'll change your attitude toward God. God is not out to get you. He's not out to beat you to death. He's not out to jerk the rug out from under you. He's not out to curse you. If God be for us, who can be against us? You remember though that broke the Sabbath? Yes, they did. Picked up sticks, stoned to death on the Sabbath day. The Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament said the Sabbath day, the Sabbath day. Man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for man. In plain words, the man is far more important than the Sabbath day. Amen. I would that people get a hold of that. That's what he said. That's what he said, but in the Old Testament before the grace of God came down upon men to teach them a truth that they burned into their soul, a man simply picked up sticks on the Sabbath day and he was stoned to death. They murmured. Israel murmured. That's a sin against God. They complained about the manna, the manna type of Christ. They said, our soul doth loathe this light bread. We're tired of it. You ever get tired of Christ, dear friend, where are you going? 
This, that's man is a type of the Lord Jesus. You see, my dear friend, we preach the ministry. We preach the buildings. We preach the money. We preach the accomplishments. We preach the people. We preach us. We preach self. But we don't preach Christ. And this is what God has burned into my soul. If nothing else, he's, he's burned this. He said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. My dear friend, I hope you never get here tired of hearing about Christ. Because if you ever get tired of hearing about Christ, you'll get tired of hearing me. Because I'm going to preach him. I'm going to preach him as long as i got breath in this body. Because he's the one that deserves to be preached. They complained about the manna. And then they brought God's motive into reproach. Think about it. They said, have you brought us out into the wilderness to kill us? To die? Why did you save us from Egypt? To bring us out here to starve us to death? That is reproach upon the, upon the, upon the ministry, upon the, up the motive of God. What do you think God saved you? Why do you think he made you? What do you think you're here for? Have you ever noticed how that these people out here that talk so much about how great man is are all the time putting you down? Have you ever noticed how that this one standard after another standard after another accomplishment after another definition of beauty after another, another definition of this and this it is constantly, constantly changing. They're laying before your eyes something that you can try to attain to how great you can be. They have you worshiping people all the time. Don't they? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. You just noticed in the last few weeks a certain name keeps popping up, popping up. A certain singer, popping up, popping up, popping up. This singer, singer, singer. This woman, singer, singer, singer. That's all you hear. And you got these people that are her groupies, that are her followers. And that's all they think about is her. And some of you know who I'm talking about. Yeah. Hey Amen. You see what I'm saying? Why? Why is she any different from anyone else? Don't you think there's a motive behind all this? Sure there is. It's to control your mind, to control your thinking, to control you. And that's what it's all about in the world. That's not the way God works. That's not the way he operates. Embracing pagan gods. These be thy gods, O Israel. That's what they said. When Aaron spoke to them and said, these be thy gods. Apis the bull. Here he is. Worship him. And like I said a moment ago, you do not go to Aaron for spiritual discernment. You go to Moses for spiritual discernment. Amen. Not, I'm not saying Aaron wasn't a good man and a believer. He certainly was. But you go to Moses, the servant of the Lord, for the spiritual discernment. He rebelled against God's appointed leaders. Dathan, Coram, Korah, and Abiram rebelled against the authority of Moses. Hath not God spoken to all of the people? Certainly he speaks to all the people. But my dear friend, the order and structure of a church, just like the order and structure here, is that God gives authority and responsibility to certain ones and he holds them accountable. Amen. Amen. And But they rebelled against that. Be very careful with human reasoning. Very careful with it. Numbers chapter 22, verse 23, verse 22 says, God brought them out of Egypt. He hath as it were the strength of a unicorn. Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob, neither is there any divination against Israel. According to this time, it should be said of Jacob and Israel, what hath God wrought? Behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion and lift up himself as a young lion. He shall not lie down until he eat of the prey and drink of the blood of the slain. God made you for a purpose. You see that part that you see. Then there is the part that the adversary sees. Then that part that God alone can see. I'm glad that God knows me better than I know me. And I'm glad in spite of the fact that God knows me better than I know me, that God hasn't rejected me for some failure that I'm going to do in the future. Digest what I just said. Some of you think that you've got to live a perfect life and I mean, whatever your definition of perfection is, by the way, which is all relevant. It depends on what crowd you're with and who you're dealing with. That's all a relevant thing. It's meaningless as it can be. But the bottom line is perfection, righteousness, and holiness is divine. It's of God. You can't perfect yourself. But the truth of the matter is you're going to fail somewhere down the road. You're going to sin somewhere down the road. You're going to do something down here that's going to be, that, you're going to be, that, you, that you wish you'd never done. He knows that's going to happen. But does he remove himself from you because of that? No. No, 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 no. He made you. The shepherd leads his flock 
and he leads his dear children. Only God can see. You see yourself, however faintly uncertain, unknown, but Satan sees a victim. Pray, another conquest. But God sees completely. He sees the full you, the parts that make you and learn as you travel this road of life. You learn more about yourself. I suffered the other day, the worst I've ever suffered since I've been here 77 years. I hurt like I'd never hurt in my life. Never. For a while, I was hurting so bad I wanted to die. I'd never hurt like that in my life. Some of you ladies that had babies, you know what it is to hurt, don't you? Raise your hand. You go through the valley of the shadow of death. You fear that, I mean, you know, well, I hurt. I'm not saying I was having a baby, but let me tell you something. <laughs> I hurt. And you know what brought, came out of that? A closeness to God. A closeness to God. I learned something about God in that, about my flesh and about God that I couldn't have learned in any other way. There are things, my dear friend, that you must experience or you'll never learn them. I'll tell you something else it did for me. It moved in my heart and my soul. It gave me more of a compassion, more of a feeling, more of a help, a understanding, a prayer for people who do hurt. Yeah, yeah, it gave that to me. I didn't give it to myself, but it gave it to me. And this is the, li this is the life we live. This is, this is what's called chastisement. Don't get all messed up with chastisement to think that God's whipping you and beating you for something you've done. That, it, that could be one part of it, but chastisement is teaching, instruction. He scourges every son that he receives. Did you get that? Everyone. I never understood. There was not one time I was convicted of something I'd done, but what happened to me was I learned a lesson. You know what that did, folks? That qualified me for a ministry that I can minister in now that I could not have ministered in before. Let me say it again. That qualified me for a ministry. When somebody tells me they hurt, I say in my soul, I know what it is to hurt. I mean, I know what it is to hurt. Four hours in surgery and you come out of that surgery, buddy, and they haven't prepared you the way you should have been prepared. You're hurting. But God was there with me. And so I pray, Lord, how mercy do I pray. And it drew me closer to him. Now, it could be that I walked out of that and got mad at God and blamed him, you know, got bitter, you know, full of vitriol and hatred. That happens to a lot of people, doesn't it? Has it happened to you? Don't let it happen to you. When these things happen to you, draw closer to God because he's in it. Nothing can happen to you. Nothing can happen to you except God's hand is in it. Satan could not touch a hair on Job's head without the Almighty's permission. Build a wall around him, the devil said. It means that the devil had already tried, hadn't he? But he had to get God's permission. He sees completely the full view, the road you're going to travel. He sees the purpose you were put here for. You're here, you see me, this is my purpose. I'm fulfilled, folks. This is my life. I mean, I piddle around with stuff, but this is my life. This is what I live. I do. What, is your, what is your life? How many of you know? How many of you really know that you know that you know you're living the life that God wants you to live? Amen? Blessed are you. <laughs> you are blessed. You're blessed. Yes, you are. You're blessed. Because there are those who do not know. They're in struggle. They're, you know, they're... They're in strife. They're trying to find the will of God. That's all right to try to find the will of God, but I'll tell you how to find the will of God. The simplest way, just draw nigh to him. Draw nigh to him. Fill your life full of him. Fill your life full of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've tried the, by the grace of God to receive the grace of God in the last few months to let the Lord Jesus Christ come more alive inside of me than he ever has been before. To live about him, to talk about him, to pray to him. Let the Lord Jesus Christ be everything that I am, that I need. He's my mind. He's my soul. He's my spirit. He's my hands. He's my life. He's everything there is about me. It's got to be the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey Amen. That's why Paul said, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. What a wonderful thing to think that your mind is the mind of Christ. 
And think of that. And that, my dear friend, has given me strength. And that'll give you strength. And that's the kind of strength you have to have. You can't generate that kind of strength. That comes by faith. He sees the road you'll travel and where he'll direct it. And then he sees your failures and your triumphs. And he hasn't rejected you, has he? No, he hadn't. No, he hadn't. No, he hadn't. I'll move along quickly for you. First Peter chapter number 4 and verse number 8 says, Above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Boy, did you get that? Did you even know the Bible said that? Now, it doesn't say that charity condones a multitude of sins. It says it covers a multitude of sins. Why? Well, he hid Moses in the cleft of the rock so that his glory could pass by. He has a place for us where he allows us to come close to him. <laughs> Are you listening? To come closer to him than you could ever come to him if you let him do it. You say, well, preacher, God won't have fellowship with anything but a perfect man. Well, then forget it and die. <laughs> Amen. Because <laughs> you'll never be perfect in this world, but he's perfect. And I hide my life in Christ in God. You remember the message I preached about the other day about that? Satan can't see your life and Satan can't hear your prayers if you keep them silent. It covers. Dear friend, God knows you much better than you know you. Deuteronomy 32, he found him in a desert land in the waste howling wilderness. Boy, did he ever find me there. And he blessed him, and you can read all of that when you get home in Deuteronomy 32, 10 through 18. But in verse 15, it says this, But Yeshurun waxed fat and kicked. Here God had blessed him so much, and he's blessed me. God's been better to me than anybody on the face of the earth, <laughs> and God has blessed me more than anybody. Now, how many of you did that make mad? <laughs> how many of you in here would say, No, wait a minute, preacher, you're getting a little carried away. He's blessed me more than he's blessed you. And... Well, that's good that you say that. God's been good to me. Has he been good to you? Amen. Amen. He's a good God. He's been good to me. What have I got to complain about? This is what he's talking about. But here's the problem with us. Even in the midst of blessing like that, we can turn around and kick. See, notice he said, but you're sure and waxed fat. He filled up. God blessed him. Some people can't handle money. You just can't handle it. You can't handle it. Some people can't handle prosperity. They can't handle it. Some people, but you should be able to, but you're not ready for it apparently. But the bottom line is that Israel could not handle it and the Bible says they kicked. That word kicked is used of an animal that is stubborn. You know what he said to Saul of Tarsus? It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. You tie animals up, you hobble them. Well, this is what God said. God said, I had blessed you then I, you kicked, you turned on me, you got fat. And then he said, I tried, to con I tried to move in your life and you kicked against it. And this is what happens. When God begins to do something to help you, he may make it uncomfortable for you. It may hurt. You may, you may, it may, you may not like what's going on. But he's in the midst of it. I don't care how great the storm. I don't care how black the day. I don't care how much hell comes into your life. He's in the midst of it. If you know him, amen, amen, if you know him. This is his heart. Let me preach his heart to you. Hosea 4, 17, Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. That's what he said. Now, Israel was separated into the 10 northern tribes, two southern. Ephraim is a, is a term for the 10 northern tribes. They became apostates sooner and longer. But he said, they've joined the idols, let them alone. But then you get to Jeremiah 31, verse 20. <laughs> and here's the heart of God. And he says, is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a pleasant child? For since I spake against him, I do earnestly remember him still. <laughs> Did you hear that? <laughs> I spake against him, but I, it doesn't end with words. He said, my heart moves for him. Now, dear Christian friend, do you know the Lord Jesus? Have you ever been born again? Where are you today with him? How far, are you following afar off? Are you, just, are you just floating around? Are you just drifting? 
Let me tell you something. His heart, his heart is moving and stirring for you. Yes, it is. And when he reaches out for you, it's going to be in a hand of love. It's going to be eyes of love. And he'll reach for you. And he will. He said, since I spake against him, I do earnestly remember him still. <laughs> what about that? First Peter chapter 4, verse 8. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Now, I can get into 1 John. We don't have time for it. But I hope you can see how this connects directly with 1 John. 1 John, where it says that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All right? But what he's talking about in 1 John chapter number 1 is the essence of it, the beginning of it, before, it's ever, before, before it ever becomes a deed, before it's ever practiced. You see, sin doesn't come from out there in here. Sin comes from in here out. It originates in the heart. And this is where God deals with it in the beginning. If he can deal with it in the heart, and purge it from the heart, then you don't, you don't practice the deed. You don't commit the deed. If you don't commit the deed, 1 John chapter number 2 is not necessary because the Bible said in 1 John 2, if we commit, if we com com commit a deed and so forth, we have an advocate with the Father, even Jesus Christ the righteous. In other words, once you've done it, it started in here and communion and fellowship with God didn't get rid of it and you go ahead and forcefully do it then the Bible says you have an advocate with the Father. That's the second stage of it. And why do you need an advocate with the Father? Because you've got a devil who's the accuser of the brethren who wants to destroy you. That's what this is about. That's what it's about. It's about communion with God. You know what the Bible says over there in 1 Peter? It says if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart. In plain words, we know that we've committed a sin. We know there's something wrong. And we, but even though Satan condemns us and tries to destroy us with it, we also know the character of God. We know that God will forgive. We know that God will cleanse. And we know that God will restore. Now, did you get that part? Because if you get that part, you can get the next part. I'll say it again. If our heart condemn us, all right, all right, we have, if our heart condemns us, we also know this, that if it condemns us, that we know God and that we know God will cleanse us, restore us. And that condemnation of the heart is not the final word. Then he goes on and says, but if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence with God. That's the second stage in plainer words. If you know you're clean right now, nothing between you and the Lord. There's no issues going on. What do you mean by issues? You're not doing something that you shouldn't be doing. You know why it's real quiet in here right now? You're listening. You're getting a hold of something that you hardly ever hear from anywhere else. What I just told you is that sin originates in the heart. And that God will allow you to cleanse it, purge it, before it ever becomes a deed. But once it becomes a deed, something that's committed, then your heart will condemn you because your fellowship has been broken. Okay? The Song of Solomon has two places where fellowship is broken. And I won't get into it with you this morning, but I'll just kind of put that out there to you to think about. But fellowship is broken. Heart condemns you, all right? And when it does, that purpose is to bring you back, to confess it, be forgiven for it, and cleanse it in the blood of Christ. Amen. How many agree with that? But, the apostle says, but if our heart condemn us not, what does that mean? That means that we're walking in fellowship. But you're also listening to God. There's no way in this world you'll walk in fellowship with God unless you're listening to him and talking to him. And if you're walking with him in fellowship, that heart doesn't condemn. And there's peace and there's joy and there's rejoicing and there's power and there's victory and there's a future for you. And this is what he wants for you. But if it does condemn you this morning, my offer to you is a very simple one. It's what he said in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess... All right, that word confess 
is from the Greek word hamalagia. Hamalos means of the same. Lagia, word. So we agree with what God says. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just for, to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You mean I don't have to crawl from that door up here and do penance and give this and burn that? No, no, that's been done. He doesn't want you to add anything to what Christ did at the cross. That's already been done. You simply agree with God and let the work of the Holy Spirit by grace work in your heart and receive and accept what he did for you on the cross and say, Lord Jesus, I've messed up again. But I agree with you. I know no, you know, no excuses, not blaming anybody, accepting my part in it. Lord, forgive me. You do that, and the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That could have been done before it ever happened inside the heart, but once it happens, and it happens to all of us, we don't always all, always make it in 1 John 1, 8 and 9 and 10. It happens, but if it has happened to you, then confess it, and he'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What did I offer you there? I offered you hope. I gave you forgiveness. I didn't try to beat you to death with it, did I? But I didn't make excuses for it either. I told you that it can be forgiven, it can be cleansed, and you can walk out of here with joy in your soul and fellowship with the Lord. Bow your head for a minute. Father, I gave them what you gave me. You've been good to me. I can't, there's no way in this world, Lord, this morning that I could count the number of times that I've had to do exactly what you said in 1 John 1, 9. Confess my sins. And I'm sure that in the future I'll have to do it again. No question about that. I'm not, I don't set myself up here before anybody as some holy man. Lord, I'm a believer. I love you. <laughs> you know that. And I want to live for you. And I want to serve you. But I want, to, I want to learn what the spiritual truths in Scripture, how, what, what, what does it mean? How does this work? And I, may, I pray that this, I got this across to these dear folk this morning. If there's somebody in this house today, Lord, that's beaten to death, Satan has beaten them to death with their sin, and they've tried and tried and tried, and they can't get victory over it, Lord, show them that the victory is not what they do. The victory was won at Calvary. And what they have to do is simply receive Christ into their soul, his forgiveness, his grace, his mercy, and his cleansing. And the victory is theirs. In Jesus' name. While heads are bowed, nobody looking, anybody raise your hand and say, Preacher Lawson, I want you to pray for me. I don't understand everything you've said, but it's beginning to move in my heart. God bless you. It's beginning to make some sense to me. God bless you. God bless you. Hands up going up everywhere. Thank the Lord. Amen. God bless every one of you. Every one of you. I'm a minister of the gospel, folks. That's what I am. That's what I do. Like I told you at the beginning of this. I'm not the sheriff and I'm not the district attorney. Attorney, I am not here to convict you and I'm not here to arrest you. I'm here to help you in the grace of God. Father, I pray for the hands now. Pray for every soul that went up. I pray you'd bless them. Move in their spirit. Move in their spirit, Lord Jesus. In thy righteous, righteous, righteous name I pray. Hallelujah to God. Amen. Let's sing, brother. Stand up with me this morning, folks.